Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, welcome to It's Good to Talk group show. This is the fifth in the It's Good to Talk group show uh, a series. I'm Donald Hislop and I'm co-hosting with Nicole Van Dyke and you are listening to this on Resonance 104.4 FM, also streaming live on Facebook and later to be posted on YouTube, all under the It's Good to Talk moniker. I'll hand over to Nicole in a minute and she can talk a little bit about the series, but uh, very basically we've been spending the last few weeks t talking to people um, from all over the world who work in culture, the creative industries, heritage and museums, a bit about their work and, and some of the wider topics that we all face working with communities of, of lots and lots of diverse and different sorts of communities from communities of, of localities to communities of artists to communities of uh, a diverse background. And although most people we talk to do work for institutions, this is very much uh, through a personal lens really. And it, we've been has, having some really fascinating discussions, finding out the distinctive work that people are doing all over the world. But of course, as we've seen with some global um, things that have been happening lately, uh, so much that uh, unites us as well um, uh, today with things that are happening. We have two guests uh, today and my internet is very unstable. So um, I may have to switch over to Nicole pretty quickly, but it's Paul Howard, who's um, a contemporary artist curator he originates from England, but he now works as visual arts curator at Bankstown Arts Centre in Sydney, Australia, a very, very diverse um, area of the city. And he's worked in institutions and on projects all over the world, um, including at Tate Modern, where he worked with me several years ago, and on projects some, such as Aqua Voltaic, about the global abuse of water, Rush Hour, which we'll hear and see a bit more about later, an exhibition around the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the Trans Translati Transland Atlantic Slave Trade Act in Great Britain. And his current project, Terra Informa, which he's working with a series of artists and performers to respond this, to the 250th anniversary of James Cook's arrival at Botany Bay or Kauai, I think is the Aboriginal word for it. So welcome, Paul. Lovely to see you. Thank you. And Nicole. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Donald. Um, um, I am uh, Nicole van Dijk. I'm from uh, Rotterdam, uh, working uh, as a curator and program leader in the Museum of Rotterdam, and mainly um, working on particip participatory projects uh, in the city where we are discovering the heritage together with people living here um, in, and we are collecting it in what we call an active collection. So it's a very dy dynamic uh, collection of uh, the contemporary heritage. Um, well, I have the honor to introduce uh, Tita Larasati. Um, Tita is working as a, a lecturer in industri industrial product designing, and you are an industrial product designer yourself. Uh, and you are working also as a lecturer uh, at the Institute of Technology in uh, Bandung, West Java, Indonesia. Um, and um, one of the things that really uh, did strike me was what you said in a video uh, that you, your work is very much um, trying to support people in how they can participate to make cities better. Uh, and if you can enable people uh, to work on better cities, um, well, you have, of course, a lot of power and, and force, uh, which you 
can use uh, to make those city a better place to live in. Um, later, we will also look uh, to one of your projects and you can probably tell us a bit more uh, about what you do. But first of all, and we, we did that with other um, guests we had in the previous shows as well. Um, we uh, would like to hear how you grew up and how um, your experiences during your childhood or maybe a bit later uh, directed you to the creative uh, and cultural world. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was born and I grew up in Jakarta, but then I moved to Bandung when I started studying industrial design at ITB, so Institute of Technology Bandung. But then, um, yeah, actually, um, I graduated with a project on bamboo because then I was looking into a material that was very much undermined. But now, of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, project about bamboo already. But then in the, in the end of 90s, bamboo is still looked upon by, especially by Indonesian, as the poor man's material, which is no longer the case now. Mm -hmm. So I was looking into that as my uh, graduating project. And then I continued my master uh, study at Design Academy Eindhoven. And mm -hmm. I look into bamboo as, um, as a future material because uh, I would try to connect the local craftsmen and the modern technology to uh, to process bamboo to make it more presentable. As then I continued to Delft University Technology, where I did my doctoral also in bamboo, but looking at it as um, structural materials, sustainable housing, uh, sustainability in general. So uh, all my work is mostly about bamboo. But then when I return uh, back to Indonesia, I, I start teaching. Um, and then I have some, of course, younger uh, lecturers and students also start to get interested in bamboo and natural fibers in general, but then looking at them as um, potential materials to develop further. Because the basic education of design, especially in Bandung at my school, and that was built by the Dutch colonial government in 1920 to teach local artists to, uh, for the Western kind of arts. So that's why we never learn about natural material because it's not seen as industrial yet. But now things have changed. So now um, my students and my colleagues, they, are, they start also exploring a lot about bamboo, rattan, and other kind of uh, reeds and uh, natural fibers. So uh, yeah, uh, but then um, I'm looking more into this community initiatives because when I returned to Indonesia after I live in the Netherlands for about 10 years, so I came back in 2007 and then, um, well, we see the city of Bandung, which uh, used to be one of the most favorite city of the Dutch colonial government. That's why it's the city with one of the most uh, art deco buildings built by the Dutch because they like to experiment with all this art deco um, style here. So uh, we thought that the city was not well managed yet because basic needs are still not uh, fulfilled uh, while we, also have uh, about 120 universities and higher education at the same city. So we have lots of young people, almost 70% of our uh, of Bandung citizens are below 40. So uh, naturally we have these groups of communities uh, who also work a lot with architecture, design, arts and so on. So from the 100 and something universities, 14 of them has uh, at least either architecture or art, craft, uh, and other uh, cultural studies um, uh, directions. So yeah, uh, that's, that's when I start having this community initiatives. Uh, we called ourselves uh, Bandung Creative City Forum in 2008. And we see the city as an organic entity, not unlike a human body, who also have a center of thinking, center of breathing, also have its own center for uh, garbage disposal, and also have all these transportation for nutrition and, and everything else. So uh, we see the city as that. So that's why we call ourselves uh, providing urban acupuncture. So if we see something wrong in the city, then we have this needle of uh, creativity to pin in. Uh, and because we are a small group of people, we don't have the whole hospital to heal the city, but we have this needle. Uh, if you do it small, but then repeatedly, and then spreading bit by bit, we hope that the part will heal. 
So we we do this um, uh, urban acupuncture and design thinking in a sense that if we have a solution, we don't only say it, but we should make prototypes or simulate the solutions. So that's why through the solutions, although small, but then we hope it has impact. Um, also, if we do it consistently, repeatedly, and uh, bit by bit in different parts of the city. So that's why uh, the, the organization is still established up to today. And that's how we see Bandung as a creative city of design of UNESCO Creative Cities Network. We got into the network in 2015 with that few points, because otherwise um, we are very much different from the other cities of design that are already in the network because we uh, see design not yet uh, as um, you know, beautiful things or things you cannot afford or very expensive, or we don't see design as a, a very established infrastructure or uh, wayfinding and so on. Because if you go to Bandung, it's as messy as other cities usually when it's very dense and everything. But then we try to make things better by doing it our way <laughs> and then uh, uh, showing the government and the people that uh, this is how a city can be. So yeah. that, that's a bit about it. So, Tita, do you? Yeah. Tita, do you? Oh. Yeah, we can hear you, Donald. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my broadband keeps freezing. So, so Tita, yeah. can you remember when we were a child? Was it? What, what was it that got you into design then? Was it, or was oh. it bamboo in particular? What, what was it when you were something when you were? younger that made you passionate about that? Right, well, my father is an architect. Uh, he's an architect uh, that specializes in sport buildings and facilities. And my mother, she was a landscape, landscape architect, but she's also very much into plants and flowers and things that I don't really, uh, I'm not really interested anyway. But uh, later, well, this mix of references mm -hmm. because they both like to read, they both like to take photos and so on. And they both like to make, uh, well, my father mostly like to make sketches. And that's, that's what I, I imitate them. So uh, when I went to uh, high school, I know that I really like drawing. So that's why I also wrote to you in my uh, brief uh, introduction that sometimes I make graphic diary. So I got published. Uh, I, I do graphic diary in my spare time. So I, if I don't type any report or do any analysis, then I do drawing. And those got published mm -hmm. as well. So um, I think so, it's because nobody told me to stop when I draw. <laughs> My parents just let me do whatever I like uh, when drawing and so on. So, and I got into industrial design because it's quite a, a new, um, new um, direction here. So people know architecture already. Mm -hmm. People know graphic design or visual communication. But then when I uh, took my study, uh, product design is the latest, the last, uh, uh, product design is the last uh, major in, in my campus. So that's why I'm curious because uh, it involves everything that you need to know, um, material exploration and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I think uh, that's interesting, isn't it? That you visualized things early on rather than writing, you were drawing them. And Paul, you have um, you are a visual artist by profession. So, but, Tell us a little bit the same about the background, where you came from, what were your early sort of influences? Mm. Or I just start. I just start by saying I love that notion of urban acupuncture. I'd never yeah. heard of that before. Yeah. It's really, yeah, I, I really dig that. That's that's really really got me thinking. Um, but my own background is I um, I grew up in a in a small town just just outside Brighton on the south coast of England. Um, and it was a very small little place and um, it, it was a, to escape was to go into Brighton really and to kind of um, see there was another world out there from the sort of small place that I grew up in. And I think for me, just growing up and wanting to kind of move into working in art was, firstly, it was about drawing actually, funnily enough. It was definitely, I was always drawing since the, whenever I could remember, you know, very young. But um, it was it was partly to do with escape, but it was very much to do with kind of wanting to see more of the world, and with the belief that there was there was more to see beyond the little place where I grew up on, grew up in, and um, you know, and and it was quite a you know small town mentality. There wasn't much in the way of art and culture, if anything, there was hardly anything at all. 
Um, and so it was a, I think it was driven by a desire just to kind of um, to sort of see a lot more and to sort of realize that there was, uh, yeah, there were worlds out there. And that's really what I was kind of, um, I think I was interested in sort of um, initially. And then moving into Brighton, when I started doing an art foundation course, that really did open up the sort of world of possibilities for me. And then that just started in motion, a kind of a desire to just carry on moving. So from there, I went to art college in London. I studied at Camberwell College of Arts and then on to uh, University of London, postgraduate. And then I've just really pretty much been sort of carrying on traveling and, and going with my work since then. And that was about 35 years ago. And I've arrived on the other side of the world in Sydney. <laughs> Just a little bit about this. Uh, I mean, we'll come to some of the, the projects that you've done as an artist, but Blacktown itself, where you work now, is a pretty interesting um, part of the, of Australia and, and Sydney. Tell mm. us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's in it's in a part of Western Sydney. In your introduction, Donald, you actually said that I worked at Bankstown Art Centre. Um, it's Blacktown oh. Art Centre. That's OK. It's I fine. It, it, they, they, they do get muddled up quite a lot, but... They're in an area of what's called Western Sydney, and it's um, it's a long way from the tourist gaze of Sydney. You know, this is this isn't on the sort of the beach sides. This isn't the Sydney Opera House. This is where the majority of people in Sydney, that's where people live. And it's in an incredibly diverse part of Sydney, of Australia. And it's um, it, it's a very global city if you like it's a very global part of the world in what i mean by that is there's there are people from around about 190 different countries living there you know there's a lot of um recent migrants there lots of refugees and and that's been a sort of patterns of migration for the last well 200 years since kind of european settlement here so it's a, it's a very very interesting place to work and and a very uh, i think a very sort of dynamic place in which to kind of situate culture in an institutional sense, but also kind of the dynamics around all of those communities and the way that they interact. So some would say there is much more culture in Western Sydney than there is on the Eastern side, which is what the tourist is more familiar with. Yeah, and, and you're working uh, as well in the Blacktown Arts Centre. Um, and how does that um, centre reflect the diversity of, of Sydney? Well, it, it's a, it's as I was saying, it's a bit, it's got around about 190 different um, nationalities or languages um, of, of people living there. But um, it, it's a lot more diverse than the rest of Sydney. Um, it's just one part of kind of this larger region of Western Sydney. Um, and so what what you find is that there's a you know there's a plethora of different sort of languages and cultures that that are, exist side by side. Um, and it's, um, as I say, it's kind of made up of people from very everywhere around the world, but also everyone's, um, you know, coming from very different sort of backgrounds as well. So it makes up a very, very interesting place to, to live and work. Yeah. But, and, and in the art centre you work in, how, how do you um, get all, a lot of those communities involved? Right. Well, we... At the core of what we do is is it engagement with communities. So often kind of projects will begin with kind of working with communities, finding out what people really want to do. Um, and it is really kind of about the sort of being active now. Um, it, it's, you know, it's moved beyond the sort of notion of a kind of like a contemporary art centre being somewhere you, where you go and you see a performance or you see an, an exhibition. It's much more about kind of active engagement and participation. And, um, you know, we're trying to find more and more ways of engaging communities right at the very beginning of kind of not just our ideas, but asking people, what do they want to do? What, what kind of um, activities, what sort of things that they want to do? Um, and, you know, as you know, I mean, anything can be art and anything can be culture. So it's, um, it's from that sort of starting point that often kind of projects come about. Does that partly answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And, and can you give an example? If you ask, well, what would you like to do? What, 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 with what kind of answers do people come up? Well, a very simple thing at the moment, because even though we've had some restrictions with COVID, we closed down for a few weeks. Um, but we did manage to maintain some activities for artists. So we've, we've kind of, a say, 
practices going on and social distancing, we could still allow artists to come in and, and work in, in the art center on, on projects. And as long as people are keeping a safe distance away from each other, they could carry on working. So an example is, is with, um, with our elders, our Aboriginal elders uh, carried on coming into the art center on a weekly basis. And they um, want to paint. They want to be able to sit down and tell stories, interact with, with staff and with, with other artists. So that's a sort of, a, just a, a very quick example really of where, um, the community are hopefully kind of um, using the art centre as a place to to belong, to feel safe, and to to really kind of be active, rather than it being kind of a a place you'd go to kind of receive culture, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's it's also a sort of studio uh, almost where people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or the activated spaces. Um, and in lots of different ways. So another example, um, you know, it's a, a large part of our um, community um, is the Pacific Islander community in, in Blacktown. And we've had an artist come in and kind of working on a, on a project, uh, painting and creating sculpture within one of the galleries. But that's very much kind of just a, a vehicle to be able to tell his own stories and yeah. for other people to kind of engage with him and to sort of listen to to his um yeah to his background to his stories and what his work's about so it's a different sort of uh, activation mm -hmm. yeah. yeah a lot of it is studio led i think more and more we're running a something called an open studio which is be mm -hmm. is um very successful at the moment where people can come in and uh make make work um uh, whatever whatever they want to do on, on a weekly basis Thomas? Are you still with us? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, like uh, that's um that's quite similar to actually Nicole when you've done, just did last weekend a version of your story uh, cafes, which is very much it's a different way, but it's putting people physically in and giving them a voice in the cultural institution. And Tita, you you um one of the things you deal with with this creative cities network is you you have this network across the whole of Indonesia, 200 cities or something like that, and um, trying to connect with communities in that way. What are some of the, 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 the initiatives that that network has been taking? Yeah, uh, that's because Bandung uh, has been an example of a creative city, so-called. So it was in 2000, I think, six or seven, that it was uh, made into a pilot for creative city of the whole Asia Pacific by British Council. And then uh, we continued with the program and we established the Creative City Forum. So we keep having these uh, guests, friends, people coming from different cities and regencies in Indonesia. So uh, we thought, okay, let's just do a, a one gathering and see what we can do together. So in 2015, during the commemoration of Asia Africa Conference in Bandung, that was a very important uh, event in 1955 that took place in Bandung. So we also invited uh, these people, communities from all over Indonesia that uh, uh, say that they want to make a creative city themselves. And it turned out that uh, that was the initiative, the initial uh, uh, forming of this Indonesia Creative Cities Network. And in 2015, we have only about uh, maybe 18 cities and now uh, in 2020, we have 220 cities together with us. Uh, in total, mm -hmm. Indonesia has 514 cities. So, so how? Have, I'm sorry. Sorry, Donald. That's great. Yeah. yeah well. That's amazing. But how, how do you, how, you know you talked about the start, the fact that, but well, what you work with is the rediscovering of, of um, design and material that was used and then um, sort of forgotten during the colonial times. And then you said this, you have a huge young population in um, in uh, Indonesia as well. How do you, how do you sort of, apart from education, is there other ways that you try and get people involved in knowing and discovering about the creative uh, sort of potential in their cities and in their lives now? because it's important yeah. to win them, that generation, isn't it? Right. That's because uh, we always try to see what is essential, what is the main challenge for us as Indonesian, because living in among 17,000 islands with 300 
uh, tribes, 700 languages, and so on. Um, our problem has been always disparity, a gap of either economy or health uh, service or education and so on. And we see that what unites us is actually that the, 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 the diversity itself. So that's why we try to dig in into what is possible for uh, everybody. So we talk about inclusivity. And then uh, these young people, uh, how we connect with all these different cities is they start to realize that we cannot always only rely on digging um, natural resources, minerals, cutting trees, and so on. So they start to shift from having this economy activity, from just digging the earth and then selling them to uh, using uh, human um, capacity to, to create, to think and to express themselves. It's like saying monetizing culture in a, in a way, but then um, seeing it positively, that's actually how you see human beings can uh, express themselves, can create and in a very safe uh, environment and ecosystem. So, uh, that's that's where we find our uh, our common goal to to be able to do that and then to be able to actually improve your livelihood through those kind of things. So we see that natural resources is still our main um, our main wealth as well. But then if we don't use it wisely or we don't say um, uh, increase the value of it, then nobody can live from it. So. That's why we try to see natural resource as another, uh, with another process. So not only digging and selling the raw um, version, but we should be able to process it ourselves with our own capacity, and then use it as a as a new form. Yeah. Well, in in that light, maybe it's nice to go uh, and and look at a, a film um, of the bamboo doom, a dome. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> And then, you, yeah. <laughs> and then you can tell us a bit about what we are looking at. Uh, so listeners yeah. on radio will see it as well. Um, I'm going to share now. Oh, and now we see the film of Paul. So this is yours. Um, and then I have to... Sorry. Remember, Tita, because of the radio, if you could describe it a bit, that would be good. Oh, yeah, we hear that. Will do. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> what we see here is actually a workshop at campus. So, our industrial design department always have this yearly uh, summer school together with Musashino Art University uh, from Tokyo, from Japan. Uh, because the, one of their professors, uh, his name is uh, Takaki Bando. So uh, Bando Sensei is very much into bamboo, he's so passionate. And this is, uh, has, this is act I think, happening in the third or fourth time of our meetings. So he did his um, sabbatical year and he's very much into Buckminster Fuller, uh, as you can see, uh, ball, bucky ball, but then made of bamboo strips. So we really did a one-to-one -one, uh, prototype of a concept of a house. So that's why it's a dome. It's a house uh, where human beings can live in it. And this, we seen this as a way to be resilient towards natural disaster. Because as you know, uh, Japan has a lot of earthquake and tsunamis. And Indonesia also just had a lot of, uh, of these uh, natural resource, uh, natural disasters. So. The concept was if human beings live in there, as you can see, there's a ball and there's a platform where you can stand. And it is maybe six meter wide or something. Uh, I forgot. But then uh, uh, the concept is if, if something's happening like earthquake or, or tsunami, then the ball will go flowing together with nature. So the human beings in it can be safe. So that's why it's like a spaceship, uh, spaceship earth of uh, Bucky. But then uh, we build it one on one to one and with lots of difficulties because because bamboo is a material that's not industrial so you have to uh, it's not very uh, standardized so you have to really make the elements uh, in exact uh, measurement otherwise it won't fit so we we did that in our um, it, it's an old uh, tennis court of ITB and. Uh, sadly, not even three days after, we had a huge um, hurricane 
and oh. the ball was, uh, was ruined. The ball then, rolled away. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, rolled away. But uh, th that's, that's one of the patents that we, we filed. So now we have a patent for that. Ball. Sorry, no. But you know, it, it, in, in the film there, you see the bamboo very sculptural. It's beautifully delicate, but it's also used widespread in scaffolding for construction yeah. work and everything is it? it is incredibly robust as, as it well is, it is. yeah paul you there's a good segue there paul because you've sort of dealt in your work with natural resources and the waste of them um, amongst other things that's the natural resources is a recurring thing in your work uh, in a sense, yeah. I was just going to respond actually to Tita's um, uh, talk and the, the film because um, bamboo is a very popular material in our region now. And I say that not just in Australia, but also I've worked with artists in the Philippines. Um, but it is a very popular um, material for artists, but also we are using it here in Australia. I mean, all of our, maybe not all of our floors, but our floors are made of bamboo and um, it's an incredibly strong uh, material. It, it's relatively cheap and it, and it, um, it, it grows very fast and it's, uh, you know, sustainable. Um, so it's, it's very popular and, and, you know, artists are making really good use of it in terms of sort of its, you know, metaphorical qualities as well as its, um, as its fit material properties. So it is, it's a really, it's a sort of real now material here in this region. I don't know if it's the same over there in Europe, but it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting more. development. Yeah, more and more, yeah, it's it? being used, mm. yeah. Yeah, mainly for inside, we also have a very wet climate, of course, here in the Netherlands, um, mainly for inside nowadays, but uh, you see it more and more. Mm. Yeah. But coming back to your question, Donald, your, the question was um, specifically about um, natural resources um, and it being a sort of a thread through my work. Was that right? Yeah particularly water I was thinking of. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the, that, that recent project, which kind of went on for quite some time, it was it was about water, but it certainly wasn't about kind of uh, water and its scarcity. What it, what it was more about, this was a project which um, I did in collaboration with the writer, David Matthews. And we pretty much went around different sort of countries filming, um, but it was very much about the kind of um, the racial stereotypes that come about through global trade um, and water was kind of had a had a sort of it we looked at its sort of metaphorical qualities more than its kind of physical properties so it's this kind of like this this sort of became this sort of bizarre material which was traded in very kind of haphazard ways from West Africa from Sierra Leone and sort of clean so to speak and through sort of dubious people in in East London and eventually makes its way out to kind of like a, an Aboriginal tribe in Australia, where it's um, they have a, um, a a very sort of ambitious use of it to make to take the water from West Africa and turn it into a theme park in the outback. And of course, this is in the backdrop of Australia being the driest continent on the planet, and water is um, obviously an essential, very essential and kind of um, important um, commodity, but also um, for First Nations people, it's uh, it's very much part of the land itself, you know, and it's it, it has a spirit, and it has it's something which is kind of very much living. And if I just go one step further, um, fairly recently, about a year ago, um, New Zealand declared uh, one of its rivers as having the same rights as a citizen. So that really kind of shows you just how important that kind of in some jurisdictions water is taken. You know, and it's a long way from our sort of notion of it's something that comes out the tap and it's a commodity to be traded. So it was a, it was a work, that particular work called Aquavoltaic was very much around these kind of, um, some of these notions of kind of how things are traded around the globe. What was that, what was the premise of that, Paul, in New Zealand? What, what was the premise of classifying the river in that way? I'm not sure what the premise was. I um I just um just just um picked up that it was the first river 
to be classified to have its own um, to have its own rights. Um, and I can't recall the name of it now either. But um, you know, it's um, in a lot of a lot of these ecological kind of developments. I think New Zealand is showing the way in in our region of how how things should be treated mm -hmm. and how we should be responding to them. Yeah. Um, Paul, we also have a sort of um, a film of you uh, where we can look at, but uh, before we do that, maybe you can introduce it a bit. It is um, the film we just discussed, Rush Hour. Maybe you can tell a bit about that film or project. Oh, yeah, that was a different project that, um, that I did with David Matthews. Um, this coincided with the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. And we worked with a theatre group, the Free Tong Players in Freetown in Sierra Leone, to develop a, a, a street-based performance, which was looking at kind of um, what it meant, what it means in Sierra Leone now in this place called Freetown, which was set up as a kind of um, a free place for returning slaves. Um, what, what did it really mean at sort of at this particular time, um, looking at things like repatriations and kind of, um, uh, yeah, lots of different things around uh, industry and uh, rights to sort of jobs and education. Um, and it, it takes a form of a kind of like a single tracking shot through the city centre in Freetown, um, right in the middle of rush hour, hence its title. And it's, um, it's about sort of freezing that moment in a sort of very busy city centre situation and allowing people to reflect on it. And to, um, and to um, also there's a radio programme uh, over the top of it, which we developed as well with the, with the performance group. Um, and that gives you a sort of a narrative and to some of the, the uh, ideas and the thinking that people had at the time. Okay, I will start just in the middle of it, so... Oh, yeah, I'll yeah, okay, go ahead. I was born in London. London. My, my parents are from Sierra Leone. Well, um, I mean, so now you think that's Sierra Leone. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I, what's that got to do with anything? No, I mean, you are saying that you are not born in Sierra Leone, but you come to Sierra Leone all the time. <laughs> BBC no more there they give out the abolition. Sarah, do not, not, not they talk about that thing. And we don't forget saying, I yeah, now Ponce Island. Now they don't they bring them slave them come where they want to go. When they bring them come, then they, they bring them come, tell to a uh, uh, government to have, tell them can I, I think say now wait for the talk for this abolition, yeah. And when they be want to bring them slave them, now inside free tongue, yeah, they bring them. Then bring all the slaves, whether you've been come on Nigeria, you've been come on Ghana, you've been come on Gambeo, but past them bring you inside free tongue, now they can free you. So that was just a little part of it. The whole is like 24 minutes or something. Mm. Um, I hope you could pick up on some of the Creo there. There was, yeah. uh, you know, it's a part broken English and uh, some of the references. <laughs> What was the first bit, Paul? Was that the person questioning the filmmaker about why they were there? Oh no, that's um, no, that's uh, the radio show host um, interviewing um, a writer who's who's phoned in into the radio show. So this the show itself takes the form of people ringing in, oh, and kind of giving their responses to the abolition of the slave trade. Mm. How did people react to you doing that? filming there. I think you told me once years ago that it was quite a big deal actually when you were filming. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, look, it was it was a year after the end of the civil war there. So the country was um, it was in, you know, quite quite a poor shape. And to sort of stop the city um, at, during rush hour, um, when it was trying to go about doing its business and kind of people trying to get into work and wherever, um, it did cause 
quite mayhem, quite a lot of mayhem. And there was a lot of kind of gridlock traffic and, um, you know, the police forces and the security forces had to be involved. Um, and it did get a little bit out of hand. So it does, it, it, did create, it, wasn't an, it wasn't really intentional to kind of create that knock-on effect for everybody there, but we thought we'd gone through all the, all the right avenues of engaging the sort of head of security, the police chief, the mayor. Um, but, you know, as I said, it was, a, it, it, was a, um, it was a very difficult time in Sierra Leone to be filming and working there with the, with the free tong players. It was, it was challenging, but we, we managed to, to pull it off. Um, but we certainly couldn't have done it without the free tong players. We had about 200 uh, actors involved with us and, and the director. So it was, it was a, it was, you know, it really was a, a true collaboration in every sense of the word. Yeah, and, and where was it shown, the film, when you made it? Was it also shown in, in Sierra Leone? Or? Yeah, it was shown in Sierra Leone and it also toured around Britain as well. Because um, in 2007, that was uh, marked the 200th anniversary since the abolition. So mm. it was shown in Leeds, London, uh, Plymouth, and a couple of um, couple of other places as well. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, I wonder what I might, might ask the three of you actually, because um, that's interesting what you were talking about, Paul, and the, that was tied up with the, the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. and. Tita, you talked a lot about um, colonialism at the start and how you, you, you sort of dealing with that. And um, we obviously know, apart from coronavirus, there's been this big um, anti-racist global um, movement uh, coming to the fore again, or coming into relief over the last couple of weeks since the incident in, in the United States. And I know that um, that's taken its own, its own dimension in Sydney, where there's it was uh, demonstrations at the weekend. Nicole, you've been working with Black Lives Matters in Rotterdam on, on in the museum, I think, last weekend. I'm not so sure what's been happening there, Tita, but I wonder if all of you would like to reflect a bit on um, that and how that sort of bisects with your lives and with your work, particularly. Tita, I don't, don't know so much about if, it's, um, if there's been anything happening there as, as a result. Uh, yeah, of course, this uh, COVID uh, for us, uh, the main challenge is to do the testing and uh, it makes us, this, these things, the whole thing, makes us realize that actually uh, for some essentials, we are still depending on uh, imported technology and uh, materials. So uh, when everything is shut, then we are forced to find our own resources, not that we don't have it, but uh, we still need uh, some standardized um, regulations and so on. And it really appears to us that learning also from other cities, other countries, that um, if you want to uh, go through this together safely, then you actually have to uh, comply to the rules. But that's very difficult for us. Um, well, also um, because people have different mindset about this, this uh, disease, a virus, because it, you cannot see it, you cannot feel it un unless you have it and so on. So people doesn't really uh, right away believe that the virus exists. So there are lots of, um, I don't know, per perceptions as well. Uh, and especially in the nations, they are very, uh, we, we kind of live in dualism. So one is very much really into technology and very, very savvy and in internet and so on. But at the same time, we are very superstitious and so on. So. Um, the balance, uh, that's the difficult to find in order to find uh, our common um, way to, to fight this. So that's why uh, we have a lot of, uh, and, and we have a lot of uh, informal sectors that are really depending on uh, human traffic and crowd for income. So as soon as the, the shutdown is, uh, the shutdown is uh, effective, then uh, because I think, if I'm not wrong, 80% of uh, the Indonesian economy is run by small and medium enterprises, which is much hit by now, and also tourism. So mm -hmm. that's why uh, what we try to cope with is uh, how to survive from this uh, level, and how would you shift from uh, delivering your product and services, uh, usually from the conventional way, to 
those with the help of digital uh, economy and so on. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's the biggest challenge now. Hmm. Quite a challenge to deal with uh, COVID-19, of course. Um, and I can imagine in Indonesia, it has a sort of certain uh, extra challenge. Um, and above that, um, I don't. Well, that was what Donald was referring to the the anti-racism demonstration, which are now spreading over the world, um, and yeah. which here in the Netherlands, for instance, demonstrating demonstrations are also uh, uh, forbidden on some occasions because people can't keep distance. Um, so, how is that in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. Are there demonstrations against racism, or is that not a uh, an issue? Uh, I don't think physically it is. But then, if we see some uh, some crowd or riots, it has to do with people not allowed to uh, worship on the worship place. So usually, mm. if you do worshiping, you gather, and then they they really they really uh, find it offensive that you are not allowed to go worshiping. So those kind of things. Okay. And um, as, as for the racist uh, things, uh, you know, in social media, there's this hashtag war. And <laughs> it's more likely that our middle class up or whoever has the access to internet is really um, twisting the hashtag into our own issues. So instead of saying, so that happens in America, one word is shifted to what happens in here. So it's like, uh, I don't think it's really polite that way, <laughs> but then um, it's really, uh, some people are really taking advantage of this chaos. So uh, what we try to do is to keep, uh, keep everything really uh, solid and stable uh, as much as we can, because otherwise people are already dealing with not only COVID, but also we have now the season of dengue fever and flooding. So mm -hmm. uh, there the are lots of multiple um, uh, challenges that we have yeah. to yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, look, there's a, there's a lot going on here in Australia, as you can imagine. Um, there's protests, not just in Sydney, um, but all, all around the, the country, not just the major cities either. The, in some of the smaller towns have been um, really big protests and uh, marches um, anti-racist but it's also in Australia it's very much about the deaths in custody uh, aboriginal deaths in custody that is which um, you know it's uh, nothing new um, but it's um, you know sadly still not really kind of um, well it's certainly talked about but it's I, I don't think it's kind of like being dealt with properly so it's, it's linked to obviously police brutality but it has a you know a very long colonial history and so I think you know for for us here it's very much connected with with the um, you know 250 years of kind of invasion um, and uh, not much progress in terms of kind of a, um, you know really um, creating better conditions for First Nations people. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's so it, it's very much, that's what it's felt, that's what it feels like here. And that's just me speaking, but also the other important thing I wanted to really say from an institutional point of view is that for us, it's, it's very important that we're creating the spaces for people to have those voices, for them to sort of um, be able to kind of do what, what I sort of touching on earlier a little bit about having those spaces like an art center to feel safe enough to come in and be able to kind of say and do you know whatever they like people often haven't had those spaces before so i think that kind of the role of the art center is actually changing and i think we can kind of play an important role in this kind of movement in this kind of anti-racist movement so it's not just a kind of matter of just looking at the legislation and trying to change things or of course that's essential and it's really important and you know and, and the various kind of um uh, institutions have to be you know, fully accountable and up, you know, that they're not. And it's, you know, it's a very sad what continues. But, um, you know, cultural institutions have a really a, a critical role to play as well in enabling, you know, people to be able to have spaces, safe spaces. So you hopefully this isn't going away. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think people sort of think, oh, it's another protest, it will move on. But it, 
you know, this is, I think this is, hopefully it's here to stay until we see, see real change. Nicole. Uh, yeah, well, um, I, I think so too. I think cultural institutions have a very important role, but they should also um, take that role. Um, and um, well, as I, I see culture very much as a way we try to live together and how we adjust towards each other and our surroundings. And well, actually that is culture. And I always say heritage is, uh, are those parts of culture we want to pass to the future. So in that sense, it's a very active way of making heritage uh, together so we can decide what we want to pass uh, to the future and what we think is important. And in that way, we can sort of influence the future uh, a little bit, uh, because as we uh, noticed this year, so many times we can't really think of the things which happens. It's so unexpected uh, life. Um, but on the other side, or at the same time, cultural institutions also have to take that role and have to be prepared um, to be the institution where they can be a platform uh, for all the communities. And um, very often um, cultural institutions are a bit slow in recognizing their role, the, the big role they can play in um, this kind of societal changes, I think. Um, so we, you we good, tell them a bit about what you did on Saturday, because I think that was quite a good bit, bit like Paul's Black, Black Tens giving the speech yeah. and giving a voice. So you, you did it in a slightly different way. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, like I said in the beginning, we are um, building a, an active collection and in that collection there are mainly people or communities um, described which are having a very important and connecting role in the city right now. Uh, and because it's, it's more difficult to make an, a sort of static exhibition, we organize story cafes in which the well, the, the people from the collection can tell their stories and share their stories. And last Saturday, we had a story cafe, which was about freedom and Katy Kotti. And Katy Kotti is a Surinamese um, festivity um, about um, the slavery and abandoning slavery. Um, it's a Surinamese uh, festivity. And there were all kind of communities uh, telling about Katikoti in, uh, in Rotterdam. Um, and there were also a lot of young people who were telling about their um, part in this traditional um, cultural uh, uh, activity. So um, it is becoming more and more Rotterdam heritage um, uh, like also Chinese New Year, for instance, or all kind of Hindu uh, festivities are becoming more and more Rotterdam heritage uh, and not only Surinamese heritage or um, Indonesian heritage. So it is being a sort of mix um, and, and a, a very important role uh, is being played by uh, the municipality Rotterdam festivals, which are enabling all those communities to, uh, on a, in a sort of professional way, uh, organize their um, traditional activities uh, together with people in Rotterdam. So last Saturday we had this story ca cafe about Katy Kotti, uh, which we had half online, half offline, so with speakers in the museum, but um, people were uh, plugging in through the internet. Um, so, and that gives us uh, a sort of platform of more than 400 visitors. Um, and that is a sort of positive thing of this uh, Corona time. We, we weren't able to reach out to so many people before. So that is yeah. a good thing, yeah. I think, um, you know, you took all, 
TT, you talked about digital and the use of it, you both did, but also you've all talked about participation and empowerment. And I think they are good examples because one of the things we've talked about before is that this digital onslaught, particularly during the pandemic, has been a bit sort of one way. And what you're showing is really practical examples of that. Listen, we, we're into the last five minutes, believe it or not, because we um, the hour always goes um, so quick. So we'll, we'll begin to draw it to an end. Uh, Tita, what are you up to at the moment? What are you, um, how do you think the Creative Cities Network and things are, are, is going to go forward in the recovery period? What are you looking to be doing? Yeah, the, with this uh, network of Indonesian Creative Cities, yes, we, yes, have, yes. we now have five task forces and we go through this phases of recovery. And then uh, I know first is the mitigation and recovery. And then now we're at the phase of reestablishing or trying to redefine how the creative industries should work um, after or during the corona because it's not going away uh, uh, within a year, I think. And there's no vaccine yet. And then we have to think about how to sustain it. So within this, um, within this um, uh, task forces, uh, I also mixed it with, um, we have a new lab at ITB at the campus I'm teaching called Blitzen Ethnography Lab Lab because we, this is like a way maybe like Nicole said, we try to gather, we try to collect uh, what people have in mind with their own uh, form of language. So visual language, verbal language, any language. And then we store it in order to be able to communicate with them about how dangerous virus is or how to get on with life but then in a language that they understand. So that's why this uh, design ethnography lab uh, is built. And now we are currently having a, a running a, we have a grant for our, from our Ministry of Research and uh, Technology. And then uh, the grant is uh, uh, within five uh, months, we have to come up with a platform where we can communicate all this um, ethnology based research in order to be able to communicate uh, what's important and what's essential uh, in order to cope yeah. with the future. Yeah, fantastic. And Paula, take this in the right way because I've, um, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations lately and I work for a very big cultural institution. You work for a very significant, important one, slightly smaller, but I, I'm seeing more and more in the recovery period, it is the smaller, more fleet of foot, more innovative, organizations maybe you know rather than the big ones that are going to actually be some of the drivers of change in the way we look forward so how are you feeling about that extending the platform continuing with terra firma in, in terra firma thing terra firma yeah that's our program which is looking at the um, art artistic response to the uh, 250th year anniversary of the arrival of James Cook in Australia. But I should also say though that Blacktown Arts Centre itself is relatively small, but we're actually part, we're the cultural facility of Blacktown City Council. So we do work under, in a much bigger institution that's been able to weather the, um, the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis. Um, and we're not, um, um, luckily we're not like of small institutions across Australia, which are really struggling with kind of, um, you know, financial security, et cetera, uh, in response to the, to the virus. So we're, we are in that sort of um, a good situation where we are part of, a, you know, as I say, a local government entity. Um, and, and yet at the same time, we are small enough to be able to adapt very quickly to be agile and to be able to be very responsive. And I think that's really good when working with artists and communities that we can act very quickly. Because I remember what it was like, I used to work you know, with you at Tate Modern and it could take years to get anything really going, <laughs> getting it off the ground. So I think smaller places can, we can respond within a matter of days sometimes and we can get a project going very, very quickly and it can respond to community need very, very quickly, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a really good thing. And maybe that is a, that is a pretty good model for whatever the future might be. Yeah. Great. Nicole, do you want final words to you? Um, well, again, uh, I really enjoyed listening to your stories very much. Um, and uh, I agree very much with Paul when he says, well, it's about 
uh, how quick you can respond to communities and the needs of uh, communities. And actually we heard Tita saying the same thing in different words. Uh, it's about how quick, but also how you can respond to the need uh, of, of communities uh, and uh, support them uh, very much. Um, so that's what I, I wanted to say, but. Great. Well, thank you, Tita. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. My As pleasure. always, Nicole. You're welcome. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you, Donald. It's been, uh, it's good to talk group show and uh, you've been watching on Facebook and it'll be broadcast on Residence uh, 104.4 FM, residence uh, residencefm.com and on YouTube. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time and stay safe. Thanks very much. Yep. Yeah. Oh.